Coming up, a lesson from the playbook of Virginia Tech's fullback. You find your identity in football, and it's going to let you down. Sam Rogers shares what's better than scoring the game-winning touchdown. You're going to realize that's what you've been looking for the whole time. And then, a two-year-old is found at the bottom of a pool. I was frozen with fear. And what happened next can only be described in one way. Absolutely, it was a miracle. On today's 700 Club. Well, welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. In case you've been watching it, the polls have shrunk to uh, uh, essentially uh, a tie. Uh, Trump seems to be surging ahead with a week to go before the election. And uh, Donald has been sticking on message like a trooper, staying away from all these sideshows. And uh, I think it's bearing fruit because the attack now is on Obamacare and people's premiums are going through the roof. And what a marvelous, well, thing has been handed him, a, a, a campaign issue that just won't go away. And we welcome back <laughs> from the snows of, no, not Kilimanjaro, from the, <laughs> the heights of <laughs> Mount <laughs> Everest. All right, Wendy's back with us. Good to have you it's back. It's great to be back. Wow, I feel like I've been gone forever. It was a, it was a long uh, trek was that we tough? did. Was it tough? Was it tough? It was the hardest thing I've ever done. Well, I don't know. We'll, we'll talk about it. You got pictures? We got pictures coming up. All right. Well, we'll, we'll look at what uh, Mount Everest is like for the one who was over there. And I don't know. Are there any other you going for? Was it K-19? Is that the big one next? Are you going to go to any more? We'll talk about that. Okay. Let me recover from this one first. All right. All right. Well, as Pat mentioned, Hillary Clinton is attacking Trump's personality once again and his controversies with women. And now a new poll shows the public overwhelmingly believes the media is biased for one particular candidate in this election year. Ephraim Graham has the story. As the campaigns push to the finish line, Donald Trump is zeroing in on Obamacare, which will see premiums spike sharply next year. Trump now says he will overturn it as soon as he becomes president. I will ask Congress to convene a special session so we can repeal and replace. Meanwhile, Clinton is again focusing on Trump's character, saying she not only disagrees with him, but that he simply isn't suitable for the White House. Donald Trump has proven himself to be temperamentally unfit and unqualified to be president of the United States. She is also raising the issue of his treatment of women, trying to bring home the female vote. I want all the girls in America to know you are valuable. You should feel good about yourselves. Don't let somebody like this bully tell you otherwise. Trump is testing a kind of buyer's remorse tactic, urging voters who've already voted for Clinton in early voting to change their vote. It's possible in four states. You can change your vote to Donald Trump will make America great again, okay? Both campaigns are unleashing millions of dollars in advertising in the final stretch. The Trump campaign is spending $25 million in battleground states, including those that have been leaning towards Clinton. Clinton has raised more than $11 million online in three days since the FBI announced its renewed email investigation. It's the most since she became the nominee. As the race tightens, Bloomberg reports both campaigns are getting ready for a possible overtime. That is the likelihood of a post-election battle. Both are assembling teams to monitor the polls in key states and possibly challenge some results. And while Americans are divided on the election itself, a new poll shows the public overwhelmingly agrees on one thing. They think the mainstream media would like to see Hillary Clinton win. A Suffolk University USA Today poll asked, who do you think the media, including major newspapers and television stations, would like to see elected president? 76% said Clinton, while only 8% said Trump. For now, the candidates are focusing on the swing states because the race in the all-important electoral college could come down to just a few states and maybe even a few votes in those states. Ephraim Graham, 
CBN News. Well, that poll about the media, the Washington Post, their reporters are like rabid dogs. They, they just have lost all reason. And the same thing with the New York Times. They have lost all reason and all sense of balance and probity. It is unbelievable how far they're in the tank for Hillary Clinton. And uh, the polls uh, are showing it because the American people realize that that thing is rigged. So uh, they don't like that. But another indicator, though, is sending a signal that Hillary Clinton could easily lose. John Jessup has that. Have been falling in recent weeks, and historically, that's a bad sign for the candidate running with the incumbent party. And of course, this year, that's Hillary Clinton, who's running to succeed fellow Democrat Barack Obama. The S&P 500 has fallen about three and a half percent since early August. Market analysts have offered various reasons for the decline, including concerns about the election. But others say stocks were simply due for a correction, and they expect the long-term outlook is still positive. Well, after more than two and a half years, Lebanon has a new president. His name, Michel Aoun, a former Army general who pledges to bring change to the Mideast nation. He recently talked with our Gary Lane to discuss some of the issues he plans to immediately address. Lebanon's new president is a former Army general and a Maronite Christian. One of Michelle Aoun's biggest challenges will be stopping the flood of Syrians crossing his country's border. One out of every four people here in Lebanon are Syrian refugees, and that's placed a tremendous burden on the economy. Earlier this year, I talked to General Aoun at his home. He told me Lebanon is nearing a breaking point, and other countries need to share the burden. We have a density of, right now, of 600 per square kilometer. In Canada, we have four. In Australia, we have two. He said ending Syria's civil war is the only way to alleviate the refugee crisis. This week, in his first speech as president, Aoun pledged to keep regional fires from spreading to Lebanon. He told me a political solution is the only way to win peace in Syria, but resuming talks in Geneva is difficult. No one wouldn't accept the other till now. They want to finish with Bashar al-Assad, and Bashar al-Assad is not, you know, uh, should he be finished? Should he, 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 he didn't lose. Yeah. He Should, didn't lose yet. Yeah. If they want to get rid of him, okay. They have to invade Damascus and get him. Aoun has allied himself with Hezbollah leader Hassan Nasrallah. That's a concern for the U.S., which says Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. Israel will surely take notice of this reference to Sheba Farms, a disputed area of land in South Lebanon under Israeli control. Aoun said his government would, quote, not spare any efforts to protect Lebanon from Israel and liberate the remainder of our lands. We will address terrorism in a preemptive manner. Gary Lane, CBN News. Thanks, Gary. And despite Aoun's remarks, no friction is expected between Lebanon and Israel under his presidency. Pat, back to you. Well, he's a pretty good guy. I'm surprised he's playing footsie with Hezbollah because he's got better sense. But uh, I guess Hezbollah is so powerful in Lebanon right now, he's, he's got to at least tip his hat toward them. But it'd be nice to see. The old days were that there was a peace in Lebanon and the Christians and the Muslims got along very well together. You had uh, a Christian president that was guaranteed, and then you had from the opposition, I guess, whatever was there, Muslims or whatever, they had the prime minister, and they got along very well together. And then all of a sudden, the PLO came in there and tore the country apart, and it's been in chaos ever since. But uh, anyhow, that's, that's uh, what's happening, and we wish the Lebanese, we've got some dear friends in Lebanon, we wish them well. Well, turning to health news, John's got a report here. That's right, Pat. If you'd like to give your health a boost in a variety of ways with just one drink, try green tea. Green tea contains powerful antioxidants. Newsmax Health points out it has shown benefits in several areas. For example, three cups of tea can cut your risk of fractures. It can also keep your eyes strong and help fight against Alzheimer's. And men who took three 200 milligrams, 200 milligram capsules of green tea daily cut their risk of prostate cancer by 90%. Green tea also regulates blood sugar so it can help prevent diabetes. Pat, the power of green tea. I take four this morning for 750 milligram uh, extra sync green tea tablets. 
You take the tablets and you also drink it. You're drinking well, it right now. I, is that what that is? <laughs> yeah. That's what they bring you. <laughs> that's, that's how come now you can fall off a horse and not break your leg. That's what the whole thing's about. See, <laughs> see what? Tell what? me the, tab the tablets. You really believe that? Well, it, it, it's, it's double strength. I mean, you can buy yeah. at the health food store. Um, and you, one's plenty, but I take four. I, I like to overdo things. But uh, <laughs> anyway. Okay. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. He's living proof, folks. All right. Well, coming up, one in three adults in the U.S. has a tough time finding work because of a criminal record. Companies say that they hire people with records, et cetera, but no. It's until you just don't even get an interview. You don't even get in the door. Stay tuned to see how one employer is changing that trend through coffee. We did a series called A Nation of Criminals. We have more people incarcerated, I think, than any other nation on earth, certainly per capita more than any other. We've had these strength, strict sentencing laws that don't make any sense. We block people up for the most minor offenses. And once they're locked up, then instead of some kind of a rehab, these people are put into a limbo. And one in three adults struggles to get a job in the U.S. because of a criminal record. And for those who do find work, it rarely matches their skills and interests. As Heather Sell shows us, that's what drove a Chicago businessman to start a company called I Have a Bean, a coffee roasting company that gives second chances to former felons. Pete Leonard first developed a love for fresh roasted coffee during a missions trip to Brazil. After returning home, he made his own roaster in his Weber grill. Around the same time, he noticed a relative out of prison and unable to find work. And I watched what happened to him from getting out of the prison system and then trying to get back into normal society, and it was virtually impossible. And Leonard's loved one isn't the only one facing this uphill battle. More than 70 million Americans have a criminal background, and Dr. Karen Swanson, who leads the Institute of Prison Ministries at Wheaton College, finds most employers simply don't want to hire them. If they check the box that asks if they have a felony record or criminal record, then uh, many employers just throw the application out. Pete Leonard's solution, take advantage of America's love for coffee by creating a coffee roasting company and hire former felons to run it. We choose coffee rated in the top 1% from a quality standpoint, and we employ people who have a felony conviction on their record to do all of the work. It's a match made in coffee heaven. U.S. prisons release more than half a million people each year, and at the same time, Americans are drinking 400 million cups of coffee a day, driving specialty sales up 20 percent. One of Leonard's early hires, Louis Dooley, left prison after serving time for armed robbery and attempted murder. It was scary, it was difficult, and I just wanted to go back in because I didn't know how to cope. You know, I didn't know how to live out here. I couldn't find a job. That was the biggest thing. Lewis became a believer and worked hard to turn his life around while behind bars. Still, no employer would take a chance. Once I explained the nature of my offense, they were just like, you know, we can't hire you. So I understood. I mean, I probably wouldn't hire someone like me either. You know, no work experience, 35 years old. I got robberies, attempted murder. You know, in my background, I mean, I'm not the ideal or model employee that you want to have. Amy ran into similar dead ends. In addition to a banking resume, her paperwork included a white collar crime conviction. Neither applicant could get past a small box. It's on most applications and must be checked for a criminal record or conviction. Companies say that they hire, you know, people with records, et cetera, but no. It's been filled. Um, you, you just don't even get an interview. I, you don't even get in the door. But at I Have a Bean, both Amy and Lewis got in the door. We all make mistakes. Some of us go to prison for them. Others of us should have gone to prison, didn't. And others just skate by. 
the fact is, I mean, it really puts us all in the category of sinners. So we're not concerned with what you did then. What we're concerned with is, who are you today? Not every hire is out of prison, but in the past nine years, Leonard has hired 35 people with a background. And today, all but two are the success stories he believed could happen. This positive result is no accident. Leonard carefully vets each employee. He finds out if they've worked to rebuild their lives while behind bars and whether they've stuck to that path after leaving. He's also a stickler for quality. I want our employees to be understanding that the reason we're able to pay them a salary is because they produce great product, not because we've guilted somebody in the public to donating money to us because we have a great mission. Leonard is more than a boss, he's a witness, watching his employees transform from down and out to confident and marketable. Today, Lewis oversees a ministry for inmates and Amy manages the front office for I Have a Bean. Dr. Swanson believes this concept could become a game changer for millions who need a second chance. This is a great opportunity for the, the church and the Christian community to help formerly incarcerated people to become entrepreneurs or to hire them. That experience can lead not just to increased marketability, but to a shot at restoration and a new productive life. Reporting in Wheaton, Illinois, Heather Sells, CBN News. Oh, that's so encouraging. We need much more of that stuff. I, I remember my dear friend Chuck Colson uh, started a prison ministry that was so important. I mean, he was underemployed in the prison. I mean, here he is, a brilliant lawyer, and they had him uh, washing dishes or folding laundry or something. And, you know, the, they're underemployed in the prison. But the idea of this whole prison thing, we've got to rethink it. We, we are a nation of criminals, and we are destroying ourselves with all this incarceration and this lock them up mentality, we've got to do some other way to bring about rehabilitation of people without putting them in jail for eight years, 10 years, 15 years. We can't do that. We've got to do something different. Well, we're going to do something different. I don't know whether I'd rather go to prison or climb a <laughs> mountain, but to Wendy is back from Mount Everest, and you went to the base camp, and I mean, it was really rough. It was pretty rough. We had gorgeous weather, though, during yeah. the day. I thought it was going to be colder. Uh -huh. I never even had to wear my long johns during the day. Um, but I've got some highlights I want to show well, you, and then we can them. chat about it. So here they are. All right. Take a look. Well, we finally made it to Everest Base Camp, 17,598 feet. Definitely the hardest trek I've ever done, but the spectacular views and the warm people made the journey well worth it. of hovering at around 12,000 feet to get used to the elevation, we are now headed up the mountain towards our ultimate goal of Everest Space Camp.
It's like triumph, Wendy. You really, but you were sick at your stomach, though. That that altitude gets to you, doesn't it? For some it? reason, I get a migraine as soon as I get yeah. to elevation. Cool. I threw up for the first few days. I said, Lord, uh, I don't have anything to prove. I've already been to the top of Kilimanjaro. Do you really want me to do this? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, don't give up. So, don't give up. Okay. It, so it worked out perfectly because we were at a place called Namche Bazaar, mm -hmm. which is featured in the movie Everest. It's a, uh, it's around 12,000 feet, and we we hunkered down there for two days to kind of get used to elevation, and it was perfect timing because I was able to yeah. to to rest for a day and recover. Um, but yeah, you know, we had glorious weather. I mean, the the views were spectacular. The Sherpa people, by the way, yeah. are so amazing, mm -hmm. uh, hospitable kind. Um, we stayed in tea houses. We didn't have to stay in tents this time. Oh, okay. That was the good news. Yeah. So, but the tea houses are cold. So when you go to your room, it's like being outside, but you just, you know, you get your, roll out your sleeping bag. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> very primitive. Are those sharpers, they have a different kind of DNA. They have something that enables them to, to handle that oxygen. They have more red blood cells is than that us. What it is? Yeah, they don't get cold like us. Um, they don't, their home, we went into some Sherpa homes. They don't have heat. So they just, but they have lots of blankets yeah. and they drink lots of tea. We drink lots of tea. How, how high did you get before you finished? We actually went higher than base camp. We went about a thousand feet higher than base camp. It's a place called Kalapatar. Anybody who's been there will know it. It's, it's a place they love to take you because you have amazing views of all of the high peaks, including Everest. Yeah. And so that's 18,500. That was a tough day. Um, you know, we were all huffing and puffing yeah. getting there. The next day we went to base camp, which is 17.5. So that was, we were actually on the way down when we, when we hit base okay. camp, but was, it was called the Everest base camp trip. Well, and the, the top is about another 10,000 feet beyond that. 29,000, 29. 29 feet, 29, 29 ever is the top of Everest. Now our, my lead guide, yeah. Vern, the guy who was playing the guitar, mm -hmm. he's been to the top of Everest 10 times. One of our Sherpas, uh, Top K, had been 20 times Dear to me. the top of Everest. So, you know, when I was standing at Kalpatar and I'm looking at Everest, and, you know, you hear about it your entire life, mm -hmm. how this incredible, in, uh, unclimbable mountain <clears throat> that's claimed many, many lives. And you're looking at it and you're like, yeah, I think I could do that. <laughs> no. Well, please. No, no. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Um, I, it, it, it still looks very difficult, but um, we were really blessed. And I just want to give a shout out to all my Alpine Ascents um, well, fellow trekkers. You guys were amazing to, to trek with. And boy, we went through a lot together. Well, you went with our thoughts and prayers, and we're delighted you're back healthy and whole. I think you're sort of healthy. You've got a little I, I've cold. got a little cold. It's well, called the Kumbu, well, Kumbu cough. Uh, yeah. We all we all got the cough around um, I don't know sixteen seventeen thousand feet. Um, well, were kinda, you exhausted at that altitude? I mean, you you were just enervated, or you felt you that? you know you just get you you are more tired, but you sleep more. You go to bed at eight o'clock, oh, you know, and you right. sleep for like twelve hours, and then you get up at six a.m. and then you start all over again, and you trek for like seven or eight hours. But um, sleeping is key. Now it's funny because you, you you almost completely lose your appetite. I after 16,000 feet. I believe that. So you're just like forcing yourself, and, and the guides are like, eat, eat, eat. And you're like, you know, you're just trying. Mm. We ate a lot of potatoes, a uh -huh. lot of rice. Um, they have something called um, dal there. It's like a curry. Mm -hmm. So, um, and they don't do a lot of meat. I mean, the, the, yeah. they're, they're mainly a vegetarian people, but they do chicken. Incredible. But uh, yeah, a lot of rice, a lot of potatoes, a lot of carbs. Well, anyhow, you came back healthy and you look good, and I'm glad to see you it's again. It's great to be back. All right. Well, later on this program, by the way, I want to introduce somebody asked me the other day, well, where's Princess Maggie? We like the little dog. And so the little dog will be here just to show you we love animals. And uh, we, we want to cover the full <coughs> waterfront today. But we've got an interesting gentleman who, work, who plays ball for Virginia's top team, Virginia Tech. That's right. Up next, Virginia Tech's fullback talks about his faith. I've played in front of 70,000, 110,000 people before, and I scored touchdowns in front of that many people. And there's nothing that compares to the satisfaction of coming with Jesus. Sam Rogers shares hard lessons he's learned both on and off the field. But first, our special guest, Princess Maggie, is with us. Her Highness, coming up <laughs> next.
Okay, uh, as you probably know, I'm an animal lover. I like to train animals. I ride horses, train horses, uh, enjoy. I've had every kind of dog you can ever imagine, <laughs> setters and pointers and borzois and German shepherds and uh, mixed breeds. And right now, we've got an Irish water spaniel uh, who I named a pretentious name, Princess Maggie. And she's here. And she is a sweet dog, and let, let her go, and she'll come over here. Come here, Maggie. Come on, sweetie. <laughs> there you go. Hey, baby. Oh, yes. You want to sit? There, there, there's a sweet dog. Oh, yes. You're such a good dog. You're such a good dog. Yes. No, no, no. That's not. Oh, that, I, I got to give it to you. All right. You want another one? Is that good? Huh? All right. All right. Lie down. Lie, lie down. Roll over. That's a girl. All right. Now, okay. <laughs> What do you want to do now? Oh, you want to bite my hand, do you? Okay. Here, jump. All right, all right. Oh, look at that. Wow. Oh, here. All right. Oh, my goodness. Sit. Lie down. Oh, don't you Whoa, hit your head. head. Poor thing. There. All right. All right. Oh, okay. Can you speak? Uh, uh, speak. 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 You're just clicking your teeth in enough. All right, sweetie. All right, here. Uh, uh, just hold still. Oh, you're such a good girl. Isn't she a nice little girl? Beautiful. This is Princess Maggie. She's six years old. She's an Irish water spaniel. And, uh, okay. Yeah, you want to come up here? All right, all right, sweetie. Oh. oh, yes. I can't believe how she can jump like that. Oh, she can Amazing. jump like crazy. She's looking for something. Yeah, oh, she wants one more of these things. <laughs> uh, you want to do some tr you know, trick for me? I don't know what you want you to do. You've done everything I guess you to do. All right, come on, sweetheart. All right, do it back. Back the other way. Come on. No, this way. Come on. <laughs> All right, sit. Lie down. Lie down. There. All right, that's it. Oh, good girl. Isn't she a sweet girl? Good girl. Irish water spaniel. Yes, you're a <laughs> sweetheart. Back yeah. by popular demand. Princess by popular Maggie. demand. <laughs> she is a purebred Irish water spaniel, and she just loves people, and she wants to move. She's got a nose that you can't believe. All right, well, well, you go over and see him now. Go on, go on, go see. Uh, there, that a girl. Okay, there you go. Okay. We saw we saw a lot of um, dogs that look like black labs on yeah. on the trail on the trek. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was interesting, and a lot of yaks. A lot of yaks. A lot okay. of yaks. I was constantly dodging these horns yeah. that were coming out because the trails aren't that big, and then you have to get over and let the yaks let the go yaks by. Get by. But they carried our bags. Yeah, the yaks sure. carried our bags. Well, you know, oh. I love animals. I mean, God gave a desire in the heart of mankind to look after animals, and if mm -hmm. we do it right, they they serve us and we serve them. Absolutely. Well, you that got a sweet fun. little dog. So sweet. She's so sweet. She She's loves so... you, too. Oh, yeah. Okay. Well, let's change gears here. The Virginia Tech Hokies currently have a 6-2 record, and chances are they'll be headed to a bowl game. A big part of the team's success is their versatile fullback named Sam Rogers. He can run, block, and throw the occasional touchdown pass. Recently, sports reporter Sean Brown talked with Sam about the real reason he plays football. Virginia Tech fullback Sam Rogers helps to solidify the Hokies' run game. He earned the starting job as a freshman walk-on in 2014. And last season, he was second in rushing yards for the team. With a new head coach, he's looking to expand on that this season. He says though he's seen some success, he's learned not to allow what happens on the football field to define who he is. I may love football, but it doesn't necessarily love me back. Um, I've had some injuries that have set me back. Um, when you find your identity in football and in your sport, it's going to let you down. It's going to leave you hurt. Um, Jesus doesn't do that. He doesn't, he doesn't let you down. That's a lesson Sam learned while in high school. He became a Christian at an early age, but says at the time, he wasn't all in and went through the motions because that's what was expected of him. To the church, I mean, I could kind of give you all the right answers. Like if you asked me who God was, I could tell you. If you asked me who Jesus was, I'd tell you he died for my sins. But it was kind of just that surface level kind of stuff. And I'm a people pleaser, I would say. So I tried to please my friends, uh, my parents, my parents' friends. As a result, Sam didn't know how to prioritize his faith over football. My sport was my God. Um, I think that was the most important thing to me. And I found that out when I wouldn't succeed in my sport and how I'd respond when I wouldn't succeed. I mean, it would, it would crush me if I didn't do well. 
In fact, it crushed him so much that he began taking it out on those around him. Until I got another chance to fix it, I wouldn't be okay. I wouldn't treat people the right way, and I wouldn't be happy about anything. Um, so I definitely think sports kind of took over in that way for me. But Sam's junior year, his heart began to change. A couple people uh, through Young Life, actually, and FCA and things like that, people really started talking about who Jesus was. And really, it really started to hit me, like, what he did for me. And the gospel kind of took, like, a whole new... Um, picture in my head of, man, this guy really came down to die for me personally, came more of a personal relationship. And through that, um, I mean, he just kept taking control of my heart. So Sam decided it was time to fully give his life to the Lord. I think it just, I think it just happens in your heart, like when you're saying, all right, I'm going to do this for real. Um, and I remember praying a prayer or something like this, like, God, I don't know if I'm already saved, but I want to, I want to know that I am. And I know that you died for me and I if I've never said this before, I fully accept this gift. From that moment on, it's really been uh, very important to me, and God just kept drawing me in. In the midst of my sin, in the midst of my struggles, He still, he still loved me, and that's uh, just His grace has kept me. Sam had a stellar high school career, but not many scholarship offers. Late in his senior year, Virginia Tech offered him a preferred walk-on spot. So I decided I felt more at home here when I came to Virginia Tech on campus. I decided to come here and you know, I was able to start right away and come in here and I ended up winning the fullback spot and you know, started as a freshman. Since becoming a Hokie, Sam hasn't wavered in his commitment to his faith. He regularly attends Bible study and events sponsored by the Fellowship of Christian Athletes to make sure he keeps God as the center of every aspect of his life, especially football. And he wants to share this message with the world. I can't guarantee success as the world puts it. And I don't think the Bible says that, but I can guarantee that God's gonna be with you through it all, through the highs and the lows, and you're not gonna have any better peace than with Jesus. And when my identity comes from that, um, there's so much peace that comes with that, and you're gonna realize that's what you've been looking for the whole time. I realize that I've played in front of 70,000, 110,000 people before, and I scored touchdowns in front of that many people, and there's nothing that compares to the satisfaction of coming with Jesus. Well, I can't say it better than that. Jesus is the one who gives you that peace, even if before 70,000 people catching touchdowns. Well, that's an amazing story. All right, Pat, what have we got? Well, you know, Virginia Tech, you have to have a state team. Uh, the University of Virginia almost pulled an incredible upset a couple of weeks ago, you know, against Louisville. They, they, they were leading, and, and it was just a one touchdown, and it was an amazing upset. But other than that, they haven't been stellar. But mm -hmm. Virginia Tech had just wiped up on everybody that they've played. They've got a quarterback that's incredible mm -hmm. and uh, a new coach, and they are really playing top drawers. So they're going to come into the finals of the uh, – Whatever conference they're in, Atlantic Coast Conference, I believe that they they're going to play Clemson probably in the in the playoffs. So it's going to be a big game, and of course Clemson is like yeah. number two or three in the country. Uh, but the one that's amazing, everybody. My wife is an Ohio State fan, and. Uh, when they play Michigan, that's going to be something else. But I, <laughs> that's always a, a kind of a backyard well, I, brawl, right? Harbaugh is, <laughs> is, is an incredible coach, and he's getting paid a potload of money. But it's an interesting, it's an interesting uh, thing that's happening. That so-called Big Ten is coming back with uh, Ohio State and Michigan. Well, right now, I want you to meet a couple named Jason and Ashley Keen. Jason loves coming home to his wife and family. He also loves going to work. He's thankful he's got a job, but not long ago he was unemployed and burning through his life savings. The Keene household is always full of energy, especially when dad gets home. It's a very joyous event when I come home. They've missed me all day and it's evident when I walk in and it's just a blessing to come through the door and be greeted by a happy family. The times weren't always easy for this family of six. After 17 years with the same company, Jason was let go due to downsizing. After I lost my job, it was really challenging. We were facing a long time without any real reliable source of income. It was really hard after he'd been unemployed for more than three months, and we had no money, and we had no money coming in, and we had to start living on the credit cards. While Jason sent out resume after resume, he and his wife Ashley used all of their resources keeping the family afloat. They quickly went through their life savings. 
If I didn't get a job soon, we were going to have to make some hard decisions. We had such a tiny, finite amount of real money in the bank account. So in trying to hold on to that for real bills, because you know they will turn off your electricity and they will turn off your water, and if you don't pay them for long enough, they will come and take your house from you. Knowing that the Keens were desperate, a friend told them about Operation Blessing Partner, One Heart Ministries. It was amazing the first time that we went to One Heart Ministries, Operation Blessing, thought it was just gonna be food, and then that they had toilet paper and diapers. Jason's job search efforts paid off when he found a job at a high-end appliance store. In about six months, I went from uh, unemployed to general manager. And we're still helping the family as they work to get back on their feet. It's very exciting to have an income again. It's meeting our needs right now. And with One Heart Ministries and Operation Blessing, we are meeting bills. If I could talk directly to the people who donate and support One Heart Ministries and Operation Blessing, I would tell them thank you. I appreciate what you're doing for us. Isn't it wonderful to help somebody? I mean, it really is wonderful to see a family that can be blessed. You know, there's so many people in our society and certainly in other society, we are very wealthy considering the average people in the world. And there are people who are suffering and struggling, and they're human beings, just like you and me. Uh, they, they love their families. They love their children. They hurt the same way we do. They hurt when they, they uh, uh, cut themselves or they get bruised. and. They need somebody to help them, and they, especially men hurt when they can't supply for their families. They want to be able to provide for their families. So if we can be there, a little bridge, you know, it doesn't take a lot, but a little bridge can make the difference in somebody's life. So what does it take to be a 700 Club member? 65 cents a day. I mean, that's about half of the price of a can of soda pop, and if you're smoking cigarettes, and I hope you're not, but <clears throat> some of them are running as much as six and seven dollars a pack, so you can get a, get cancer and spend seven dollars, or you can give something to the you know serve the Lord. But for those of you who do, <clears throat> I want to give you this. I am really thrilled about this. It's the Gospel of John, and it was my privilege and thrill to be able to go into our audio room and read the Gospel of John, and it, it just inspires you. And then Edie Wasserberg, who's so very talented, took the reading and she added some music to it. And she also has some beautiful visuals along with it. And for the DVD, that's this. And we also have the CD you can play in your car. But um, we give you this as, as our gift to you. Telephone number is easy to remember now. It's 800 700 7000. And here's some comments on this very yeah. thing. Yeah. yeah, people love it. They're yeah. so glad you did that. Um, Dirk from Upland, California says, How wonderful is the Word of God. Thank you for bringing it to life by reading the Gospel of John. Due to vision problems and other health issues, we appreciate listening to the scripture. That's true. So many people. Yeah. You don't have that luxury of just being able to open well, the word. The, the response, especially from men, has been overwhelming on this. I'm, I'm just so delighted. Okay, you've got something else. Yeah, still ahead. A two-year-old wanders off and falls into a pool. He was cold and blue, and his pupils were enormous. There was no color in his eyes. I remember holding his toes and kneeling at his feet, and they were ice cold like popsicles. Watch this heart-stopping story that's coming up. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. Two police officers were gunned down in their patrol cars in Iowa overnight in Des Moines and nearby Urbandale. Police have identified the suspect as 46-year-old Scott Michael Green. A public information officer told reporters there's, quote, a clear and present danger to police officers and the public while Green is still on the loose. Both officers were shot and killed in separate ambush-style attacks, and there wasn't any interaction between the officers or the suspect when the shooting occurred. A student and his parents are suing a high school in South Bend, Indiana, over its annual Christmas pageant. They want to stop the school from showing old versions of the show that have live nativity scenes. The superintendent and the school board say they won't include any live nativity scenes in their Christmas spectacular anymore, but plaintiffs argue replacing a live show with mannequins is not enough. They say it should be stopped altogether. 
Well, you can get the latest from CBN News by going to our website, cbnnews.com. Pat and Wendy will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. We've had over 29,000 requests for our Protect Your Heart DVD. This is it. We want you to have your own copy. We'll send one to you absolutely free of charge. That's right, completely free. Just call the number on your screen right there, 1-800-700-7000, or you can log on to CBN.com. You can also stream all five parts online, again, free of charge. We really believe this is going to protect your heart, and we want you to have it. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, frozen with fear, that's how Stephanie McDonald described her reaction when she realized her two-year-old was at the bottom of a swimming pool. Her husband, Robert, instantly sprang into action, diving into the water to rescue his son. But he soon realized that his child was as deadly cold as his wife's fear. Robert and Stephanie McDonald remember the day well. It was Super Bowl Sunday, 2012, and they had gone to a friend's home for lunch. As Stephanie was rounding up the kids to eat, she noticed their two-year-old son, Jace, was missing. She says, we can't find Jace. At that point, my friend and I exited the back door and saw that the pool gate was open. So we sprinted to the pool, and uh, my friend was in front of me, and he reached down and, and, and grabbed Jace from the pool. And as I saw him come up with Jace in his hand, I just began to cry out, Jesus, my Jesus. As soon as I knew that Jace was in the pool, I was just in such shock. I was frozen with fear and I couldn't even move. Stephanie called 911 while Robert and his friend Eric performed CPR. At that point, we had laid him on the pool deck and he was cold and blue and his pupils were enormous. There was no color in his eyes. My first thing was that my son is, is dead. He's gone. He's lifeless. And the one thing that was in my mind is that, you know, Jesus, your promises are true. So we continued to do CPR and we would trade off, my friend and I. EMTs arrived within minutes. Robert stayed with Jace and continued to pray. I remember holding his toes and kneeling at his feet, and they were ice cold like popsicles. Captain Joey Ruiz was one of the first EMTs to get there. As soon as we saw a blue kid, we knew that he wasn't getting oxygen, so we needed to do whatever we can to get him that oxygen that he was trying to get when he was gasping for that air. They uh, were not able to get a regular heart rhythm on this young child, and uh, so they were beating his heart for him through CPR. Jace had to be intubated. Meanwhile, a life flight had been dispatched to a landing area nearby. We loaded him into the ambulance, and at this point, which felt like forever, we knew that the helicopter was about five minutes on top of us. Our hands are just out and praying that, you know, we still have our son alive. After the chopper took off, Robert and Stephanie rushed to the hospital. I was asking God confidently, you know, Lord, I know that you can do anything. I know that you can. I know that you can bring my son to life, and I pray that you do. But if not, I know that you're going to comfort us and everything's going to be OK. They called friends and family to pray. At the hospital, the news was grave. Robert wrote down exactly what the doctors said in his journal. At shift change, Dr. Mike had come in and, and was very negative. He said, Jace had pneumonia, antibiotics won't work, lungs were shot, and it was all over. At this point, uh, I remember there were a lot of people there coming to visit and support us, and um, our pastor had told him, hey, he, it's time for you guys to you know, head out. By now, little Jace was in a medically induced coma. He was also on a ventilator. The question was, for how long? The plan was to leave the vent on until he showed improvement, assuming he lived. But Stephanie had a strong feeling it should be taken off right away so his lungs could recover on their own. So that night, she and Robert prayed about what to do. The next morning, there was no doubt. 
I woke up and I was just so full of peace, I can't even explain it. I was singing worship songs and praising God and Robert walked in and he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, today a miracle is going to happen. Something good is going to, it's going to happen. I just know it. Jace is going to be okay. And um, we went to the hospital and I walked right in and I told them, you know, we need to drop Jace's medication. Robert and Stephanie understood the risks, but were convinced it was the right course of action. So as I'm standing there with my arms raised high, I just put all my faith and trust in God. And they pulled that tube from his mouth. He sat up and was breathing on his own. And uh, I remember Caleb playing and uh, the newsboy song, God's Not Dead, came on. And it, it goes, let love explode and bring the dead to life. And that's exactly when they pulled that tube out, right at that moment. And I knew, I knew that was God, you know, giving me a little wink saying, it's okay, he's gonna be fine. I just remember Stephanie saying, can I hold my son? And the respiratory nurse said, yeah, he, you know, you can hold him, do whatever you want. So I grabbed him and I held him. And I just remember thinking that I didn't think I was ever gonna get to hold him again. And that was such a precious moment for me to get to hold him in my arms again. In just one week, Jace went home and he needed no therapy at all. Now four, he loves playing with his three older sisters and little brother. I just appreciate the gift and the blessing that he is every day. You know, every day is just such a gift with my, with my kids, with all of them. Miracles can only be explained by one person, and that's who created us. And there's no explanation for seeing my son dead on a pool deck, but today I see him running around full of life, strong. Do I think it was a miracle? Absolutely it was a miracle. Statistics may say this, and the doctors and science may say that, but that none of that matters to God. God can do anything. He's the great physician. He's the one in control. That is incredible. God is the one who is in control, and He still does miracles today. That is incredible to me that the parents had that yeah. intuition to know to take their son off. Uh, we got to realize that God, there's no death with God. He doesn't die. He lives forever. He lives in eternity. And when we enter into God's presence, we're dealing with eternity. And those people entered in and touched God. And eternity came in and touched that little boy. But you see that sweet little kid, I mean, he just breaks your heart to say, you're holding his feet and they're freezing cold and that precious little boy is dead. Yeah. He was dead. Absolutely. And God touched him. All right, let's pray for people. What do you got? Well, Barb of Mount Pleasant, Michigan had a very painful lump on her neck for two weeks. Then one day she received this word of knowledge spoken by you, Pat. You said your neck, there's a bulge there. It's like a muscle. Uh, it's very painful. Touch it right now in Jesus' name. It is healed. Barb put her hand on her neck, and she could not feel the lump anymore. It was instantly healed. Well, how about Lord. this one from Johnson City, Tennessee? Yeah. Sue had severe migraines. She was given medication, not didn't work. One day, she heard Wendy say, quote, I see a lady and you're in front of your TV on your knees. I think your name is Sue or Sue Ellen, and you've been suffering from migraines for more years than you can remember, and you're just so ready to be healed. God is saying, to this is your day, receive it. And Sue says, that's me, and she hadn't had a migraine since. How about them apples? Isn't that great? I love that. Yeah. I know. <laughs> Welcome back from every step. Yeah. All, right. All right, we're going to join yeah. hands right now. We're going to believe God. Father, Thank you, God. we pray for these in this audience. Lord, we want to touch the eternal, touch the invisible. Lord, we know that with you all things are possible. Yes. Somebody has a broken rib. Charlie, I believe you... You've had a, a broken rib, and that rib is healing. Just touch the side of your of your body where the rib is, and God has just healed you. Wendy, do you have anything? Yeah, there's uh, God is touching people with mouth problems, Thank mouth you. issues, or someone with a broken tooth. God is is healing you, is fixing that. Um, someone with just um, a gum disease, God is touching you right now. In Jesus' name, just receive your healing. Thank you, Lord. This I believe the man is Demas or uh, Demery. Uh, you, you are 
gripped with unreasonable fear. Mm. Perfect love casts out fear. And right now, the spirit of fear is leaving you. We cast out that spirit of fear. In the name of Jesus, you are free. In Jesus' name, touch. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for being with us. I guess that's all the time we've got for today's show. We've got a lot of interesting things, and I appreciate all the guests and all the news and all the stuff that's happening. And we'll keep you informed about what's going on in the nation. I think that WikiLeaks dump is supposed to be today or tomorrow with more startling revelations having to do with the what Democrats. What are they waiting for? I mean, it's with six days well, to the they, election. They spread it out, I guess. They, they like to keep us on edge. Well, we leave you today's Power Minute from Job. Submit to God and be at peace with Him. In this way, prosperity will come to you. Well, tomorrow, former Hollywood actress and dancer uh, for Prince, for, for Prince uh, Robia Scott, joins us live uh, on that edition of the 700 Club. For Wendy and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.